Tony Basil, I'm currently the um, Chief Operations Officer for the New Air Alliance. We manage one of the FAA's seven unmanned aircraft test sites uh, located at the former Griffiths Air Force Base in Rome. Um, I spent 31 years in the Air Force and Air National Guard as a fighter pilot flying um, A-10s and F-16s. I was the wing commander of the 174th Fighter Wing and spent the last two years of my military career as the chief of staff of um, all of New York's Air National Guard system, um, five flying wings and the Eastern Air Defense Sector and about 6,000 airmen. That is uh, quite a background, sir. So <laughs> thank you. do you want to talk about a little bit how maybe the Air Force prepared you to take on being the chief of operations for that? Yeah, so the military in general, but I'll speak, you know, primarily about the Air Force because um, that's near and dear to all of our hearts, um, teaches you leadership from pretty much your very beginning um, um, times with, you know, whatever you happen to be doing in the Air Force, um, whether you're in Air for, um, AFROTC or you know, myself, I was out of college when the opportunity presented itself to go to pilot training for the Air National Guard. Um, so I was sent to a commissioning school. Um, but Regardless of whether you're doing ROTC or being commissioned at, at some other venue, very big on leadership um, and planning and executing planning, um, which turns out to be when you finally do leave the military to be a, a very um, highly sought after attribute of, of um, commercial companies who are hiring um, retired uh, veterans. Um, they understand that the leadership that you gain throughout your military career is irreplaceable in the civilian world. So typically, veterans are, are highly sought after um, by commercial concerns. Um, so, you know, whether you decide to make a career of the military or not, at some point, you're going to be leaving the military. Um, so I spent 31 years in the Air Force, and I was still in my early 50s when I got out of the Air Force, and it's a little bit too early for most people to just sit back and do nothing. So as you're looking for some sort of employment that's, you know, going to um, be of value to you and, you know, something that you, you like doing, um, those folks that you are interested in working for are going to be pretty um, excited and happy about the military training that you received throughout your career. So for me, for doing what I'm doing now, uh, obviously aviation-based career with the Air Force, um, unmanned aircraft, it's kind of been, um, that, that industry kind of exploded here in the United States about 10 years ago. Um, working with the FAA is really what I, do mostly. It's um, somewhat frustrating. Um, the FAA is very, um, they make very incremental progress moving forward with um, safely integrating this technology into the national airspace system. That's really what the test sites are there to help the FAA do. Um, but my, my military career, aviation career really lent itself to what I'm doing now. Um, so regardless of what you do in, in, in the Air Force, there will be a segment in the commercial um, commercial segment that that will value what you have learned and you know gained throughout your military career. So, sir, how would sorry, how was your transition into the military compared to your transition out of it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, both had um, had issues. You know, I was out of college um, working at carrier air conditioning as a as a supervisor for about two years when the opportunity presented itself for me to go to pilot training. Um, I had no flying experience. 
And I realized that I probably should go out and pay for myself to, to get three flying lessons in a small general aviation aircraft just to see what it was like because I'd never been in a small aircraft. Um, so transitioning into the military was actually easier for me than transitioning out. Um, there, the business world, the commercial world, um, the, the goals and the mission are completely different from those of the military. Um, mission of the military, basically, regardless of what service you are in, is to serve your country in, in whatever is asked of you. Um, the goals and the mission of business is business. Um, and it's, it's more cutthroat and bottom line defined than what the military is. Um, and also one of the hardest things for me to come to grips with was not wearing the uniform after 31 years. Um, that was probably the biggest adjustment for me. Um, but everybody has to go through that. And, you know, if you just know that going in that, um, the, the relationships that you make in the military are probably going to stay with you forever. Whereas the relationships you meet in the commercial world may or may not. And in most cases that won't, because there's a lot of moving around, um, in the commercial world, even though I went to pilot training with, um, um, with people that I probably live on opposite sides of the country from me, I still keep in touch with those folks. They, you know, I would still drop everything and, and fly across the country if you know somebody needed me. Um, whereas I'm not really sure that that really happens in the commercial world. It's really interesting you say that because talking to other retired officers, it seems like they really made those lifelong connections. Yep. Like they all say the same thing about um, the people that they worked with. That they would, you know, drop everything. They would be there. Yep. And I think that this is really a nice thing that I think it's, the Air Force offers. It's a great thing. And, you know, the probably the only other area outside of the military that, you know, has those sorts of, sorts of relationships are also in government service with emergency responders, you know, um, police, fire, um, mer all emergency responders. You know, they, you, you place, basically you place your life in other people's hands. You take their lives in your hands. And, you know, there is a trust there that you just don't get in the in the commercial world of, you know, selling stuff. Yeah, you've touched a little bit on this already, but what advice would you give to cadets who are interested in being pilots or what should they do to kind of get ahead of the competition? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, you know, so many things have changed since, you know, I I was. Um, facing the same thing that you folks are facing. You know, there were there were percentage-wise more manned cockpits available. You know, now there's, you know, there are less dollars, more expensive airplanes, which means there are less cockpits available. Um, so um, preparing yourself, if you, if you really are set on being a pilot, um, you don't necessarily have to have a private pilot license. But knowing about aviation and maybe taking some lessons like I did um, will, will give you a leg up on those that don't do the same thing. Um, and maybe having some, some leeway in what your goals are. You know, again, there are less fighters available now than there used to be. Um, flying is, I mean, I don't fly fighters anymore, but I still fly. Flying, once it gets into your blood, is a terminal disease. It, it just, it makes you happy, regardless of what you're flying. You know, I fly little airplanes around now. Um, my wife and I fly all over the country to see our, our kids. And um, so if, if there aren't fighter cockpits available, but there are transport or heavy aircraft or helicopter or whatever other cockpits available, consider doing that because there's also the opportunity downstream to potentially transition into something else. Um, the airlines love military trained pilots. Um, and, you know, right now, like everywhere else, there are shortages of pilots in the airline industry. 
Um, when you go to military pilot training, you're going to be signing a commitment in you know seven years. When I was the when I went through, I think it's ten years, maybe even more than ten years now. Um, but it it's great training um, for regardless of whether you stay the whole twenty or more, or whether you decide to pull the plug and go to the airlines at, at some point. It's great training and it's it's sought after training. How you're talking about how like flights kind of in their blood and stuff like that. We have a few cadets here who are super interested in flying. They want to be pilots and all of that. What was the moment in the Air Force that you realized this was your passion? Yeah, you know, I tripped over an opportunity. You know, I mentioned that I was working at Carrier. My direct supervisor, his son was a pilot at the 174th Fighter Wing here in Syracuse. And he had pictures of him under his desk. And he just kept telling me, you don't want to work a carrier your whole career. Go on out, take the test and, you know, go do something really cool with your life. I went out and took the test and retired 31 years later. I mean, I, I saw an opportunity in, although our my family um, questioned it at the time, you know, because it's not your typical, you know, career path. Um they supported it and it was kind of a gut check, you know, where I was making decent money. A carrier was a big company at the time and pretty much took a 50% pay cut at the time, but it just, it, it seemed to work out, you know, the, um, the, the pay and the allow and the allowances and how the military takes care of you in different areas. I really didn't notice a pay cut and, um, if I didn't have any higher passion for flying as I was growing up than any other normal kid. It just said, I, I saw an opportunity and I thought, you know, I, that, I think that'd be really cool to do that with my life. And, you know, it just seemed to work out. So that, that's another piece of advice that, you know, I'll throw out to, to you folks is don't be afraid to try something that wasn't necessarily in your plan going forward. Um, evaluate everything that you see in front of you. And if it looks like something that could be attractive to you and, you know, might interest you, then don't be afraid to, you know, change horses. Um, what is a lesson that you learned in the Air Force that you won't forget? Um, I think relationships matter. Um, you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit, but um, the guys that I flew with, um, you know, most of us flew in multiple combat um, scenarios. We were, you know, a bunch of us flew in Desert Storm. Um, we did the no-fly zones um, in, in Iraq and Kuwait. Um, and, you you know, we kind of talked about this earlier also, where you, you know, you're responsible for the person that you're flying with or working with. Um, so I think the lesson that I learned is that I never would have had those kinds of relationships had I just would have stayed a carrier or stayed in the, in the, you know, the commercial world. You know, there's, I would have, you know, I had the opportunity to go to the airlines early on, um, decided that I, it really didn't interest me. I would have made way more money um, than staying in the military, but I wouldn't have been as proud of what I've done um, based on the career path that I did choose. Um, it was never really about money. I was always, you know, we're comfortable in our lives, um, but the gratification you get from serving your country, wearing the uniform, you can't really put a price tag on that. What is something that you wish maybe they had told you going in um, and becoming an officer that you had known about when you were younger? Well, you guys really have some great questions and some of them are making me you know, step back and think, you know, I don't know that I really had anything um, because, you know, as you start is, you know, you folks are going to be commissioned as second lieutenants. And, you know, there's not a lot really expected of you other than to learn and um, continue to learn. So 
they they don't expect you to be an expert at anything. Um, they expect you to pay attention, inform your own opinions, and, and be a good leader at some point. And you know, not everybody can do that. You know, we we started with sixty people in my first pilot training class. We graduated thirty. Part of that was because, you know, they they didn't have a they couldn't adapt to flying for whatever reason or another. But some of them just couldn't adapt to the military way. Um, you you are getting you you are getting uh, in advance on many many folks because you're going to go through basically four years of some sort of military indoctrination, and that's going to help you once you are commissioned. You know, you're already going to have a head start on, on like the folks that you're going to be overseeing. And they're going to look to you for guidance and you're going to feel somewhat intimidated because you are you are a brand new officer. But that's what the that's that's kind of the beauty of the process is you continue to, to grow in rank. You also continue to grow in leadership and responsibilities that are given to you. And the pace just seems to be right. So whoever came up with the with the rank structure and the training that goes with each one, you know, they had it together. So it, you know, it seems to be working. I, I'm not really sure that I could have prepared for for what I was in for. Um, you probably have, you know, I went to six week commissioning school. You're going through four years of you know, and it's not every day I get it, um, but your yours is a more um, in-depth, you know, planning and preparation for what you're going to be facing, regardless of what career field you you take. Um, so you're going to have a bigger advantage than I did, um, but it worked out for me. Um, it'll certainly work out for you. But you know, it's really how much you put into it is really what counts. How do you know when you're ready to be a commander? You guys are killing me with these questions. It's you, okay, it's the last that? one we have, so. No, I mean, they're great questions, but they're really making me sit back and I don't know that you ever know. You know, I think, um, you know, that wasn't one of my goals to be a commander. You know, my goals, and you know, this is probably pretty good advice as well. And, it worked for me getting through pilot training, but it worked for me going through my whole career. And that was to set goals that are achievable in a relatively short period of time so that you can see that you're making progress. So when I started pilot training, my goal wasn't to get my wings. My goal was to make it through the first week of academics and not get thrown out. And then my, my next goal was to make it to the flight line and get my first ride in a jet. And then my goal was to solo and you know you see how that's working the same thing works for your career as an officer you know my goal is my i think my goals as officers um in, you know my each rank is uh, in my officer career was just to do better and accept the responsibility that was given to me at each next level and kind of before you even know it you know, you've been groomed to take on some sort of leadership role in, in the in the aviation world, in the fighter world, it's, you know, you start out as a wingman, you follow the flight lead everywhere that person goes, and then you eventually become a two ship flight lead and now you're leading somebody around, and then you become a four ship flight lead, and there's incremental goals that happen that continue to progress you through your experience and you know, I, I think, you know, if I could give any of you, you know, advice for you to pay attention to and really um, take to heart is don't set your goals on becoming a commander. Set your goal on something you can achieve that you can see that you're making progress. And, and the commander positions will come, you know, at some point. And it, they typically come at the right at the right time. And if they don't, then you just need to work harder, you know, um, so that you're ready when it does come to you. I think uh, that's really good advice. And I'm going to try and follow that because personally, I had asked myself, you know, am I ready to be a leader in this leadership position? Um, 
So thank you for that advice. And yeah. you know, I never knew if I was ready, you know, the, um, but people that you work with and the people who make decisions on whether you're ready or not typically know you and they know whether you're ready. And, you know, there's some trust involved in knowing that, you know, they're going to, they wouldn't recommend you for a leadership position if you weren't ready for it. Um, you know, when they offered me the wing, 1,200 people and, you know, 18, 20 airplanes, um, I didn't know if I was, you know, up to it, but you grow in the job. It's every new job, you know, every new job sucks. It's just, you know, you're, you're just not, um, it's, it's uncomfortable because you don't really know the lay of the land yet, but you grow, you, you grow into it. And the same thing with uh, the chief of staff job, you know, 6,000 people. I mean, that's, that's a pretty intimidating job to be sitting on top of, but your, your experience throughout your military career will prepare you for that stuff if you're paying attention. Well, I think that's all of the questions that we have. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to answer these questions and um, just to be here and share your knowledge and wisdom. Happy, I'm happy to, you know, be a part of this. Um, you know, I was there for the 9-11 thing. I was your guest speaker for 9-11 ceremony that you folks did. Um, very proud of you for not just for that day, but for, you know, choosing to do something on behalf of your country. So I, I wish you the best of luck in your careers. Feel free to reach out if you need me to do anything.